Welcome to the cultural highlight of the Climate Adaptation Summit in the Water Event, a cultural mirror on climate. It's a photographical interlude in between political pledges and climate commitments. And I have three photojournalists joining me today. World Press photo winner Kadir van Lohuizen, photojournalist and documentary photographer Cynthia van Elk, and joining us online from India, Supratim Bhattacharya, in-depth visual storyteller. With them, we want to zoom in on climate action through their lenses of photography. Because water is not only at the heart of climate action, it is at the heart of the people that suffer from climate change and at the heart of the stories the three photographers tell and help us inform on how to do better. Their photos, their images are mirrors to the world of what is at stake, what we are losing, but also, as you will see today, where there is hope, where there is optimism and ideas on how to change course. Their photos are all calls to action, inspirations for us to step up. And they show the world that we have to take climate action now for our planet and for humanity. Not alone, but forging coalitions across cultural and climate suffered communities for only together we can protect health, save lives and take the climate action necessary. So let's do start this conversation and go over to Kadir, Cynthia and Super Team. And I'll start with you, uh, Kadir. Uh, welcome to the studio. You started your career already in 1988, a uh, long time ago, and traveled the world since, uh, covering conflict uh, zones and regions in Africa, social issues in the former Soviet Union, and migration across the Americas. But today we want to talk about your long-term project on rising sea levels, and, of course, your new book. This new book, after us, the deluge, the human consequences of rising sea levels. It's like a trip around the world. Eh? You traveled really all these places and for a reason. Can you tell us a little bit why you traveled the world? Why you took this journey? And also, the book does not seem to be like a normal photography book. Can you tell us a little bit more about the book? Kadir. Yeah, it, it kind of started uh, back in 2012 when I was t t working on another project and I came to this beautiful group of islands, uh, the San Blas Islands in Panama, and people told me actually that they were being evacuated and I didn't really understand what, why they were and then they told me because the sea level is rising. So that was for me kind of the first time that I understood that, there's, that it's actually happening today and not tomorrow and it's just not something which needs to be addressed by next generations. So uh, that was basically the start uh, of, 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 of this project where I started to research the, the urgency of different regions in the world. And I really wanted to show that this is not just far away if you are European or American and this happens in the Pacific or in Bangladesh, but that this also happens close to home. So it's uh, the UK is uh, included the US, and, uh, but also the Netherlands, my home country. And the book, uh, yeah, it's, it's not a traditional photo book in that sense. Uh, nine authors have been uh, uh, so great to, to contribute uh, text to it. So it's a mix of journalists, scientists, leaders, and, uh, uh, and other people. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of maps and uh, infographs in it as well. So I hope I reach a I can reach a wide audience and, and really to, to make a point that this is a very urgent matter. So Panama for you was a wake-up call uh, yeah, back in 2012, and now you bring that call uh, to the world. You also say you mix the data, the maps, the stories uh, th from activists uh, to uh, pol uh, politicians. Uh, and of course, in the mix with your own uh, uh, photos, which is important. So it's both science driven, as well as uh, being very empathic, uh, uh, including the stories of the people. Uh, and then across the world. Was it important to show all these different places from around the world? 
I think so. There's, there's sometimes an assumption uh, also in the Netherlands or in Europe or that, that, that this is uh, not a problem, uh, that it's not our problem, yeah. that this is far, far away. away. And, and really when, when I've been working in the Pacific or even also in Bangladesh, you know, I mean, it's, the people are paying very high price, uh, basically of uh, where they have a very low carbon footprint, uh, where, where actually we, we are causing the havoc. Um, so I really wanted to, to show this and I really wanted also to show what the issues are for people but also what their, their strengths is and, and they really try to, uh, to adapt. Their uh, threat should be our concern, you also say. Obviously, yeah. obviously, because it's, uh, and that's, uh, I, th I believe, a, uh, often a problem that, that it's being seen as, an, as national problems, that Bangladesh has to deal with it, the Pacific has to deal with it, but, but it's an international problem which, which needs to be internationally addressed. Not to mention that we are losing a few countries in yeah. the world in the future. Yeah. You know, I mean, Pacific nations like Kiribati, Tuvalu, but also the Maldives yeah. uh, will probably cease to exist. Um, this hasn't been addressed internationally at all. I mean, we, we do speak about climate refugees, but it's still not countries. A, yeah. disappearing countries and cli uh, fleeing for a climate and getting asylum for that is still not no. being addressed properly. So that global effort is critically important. So we have a global, uh, the first global adaptation summit. But at the same time, adapting in countries that disappear uh, seems like a crazy word yeah? um, and will have a, a different meaning. Is that true? What, does that resonate in your images too? Is that when countries disappear, adapting is not enough? We have to find a different type of change? I guess so, you know, I mean, but obviously we, we, we had the Paris Agreement. Uh, there is an agreement that the temperatures in the world should not rise by more than uh, two degrees, preferably one and a half degrees. But we are more than five years later and this doesn't seem to work so far. So every day we are losing is, uh, is having a great impact on coastal regions in the world. So um, I, do, I do believe that this really, it's a real call for action. and. Yeah. That also, I mean, if you look at the U.S., obviously people, the, they're not going to lose the U.S., but people probably will have to relocate because the U.S. East Coast is, uh, is almost unprotected from the sea. Yeah. Um, so mitigation first, adaptation close to that, but there's a different need for change uh, needed too, uh, you say. And that's also perhaps the reason why you included the Netherlands. Seems like the best protected delta of the world, <coughs> champions of water management. What, you know, what's the reason the Netherlands is in your book? In, initially, it was not a plan because I, I, although I live in Amsterdam and I live below sea level, um, it, I, it probably we are the, the most, uh, the best protected delta in the world. But that was, a, for me, it was also, I grew up, uh, in the Netherlands where, where there was still kind of a fear of the sea. The, the, we were working to fortify our coastal defense systems and, and it feels like we, we got in this comfort zone and, uh, and we sitting back and relax and see what happens in the rest of the world and we didn't consider that, that this could happen to us as well. So I think it was late 2018 well, when Deltares, which was commissioned by the Dutch Delta Commissioner, uh, looked at the worst case scenarios actually yeah. because somehow if we talk about the climate crisis We always want to look at the best case scenario where I believe we should look at the worst case scenario And it was said that there's a possibility that sea level could rise by the end of the century, which is in 80 years uh, One to three meters and the Netherlands can probably deal with one meter, but not with three meters So there are different scenarios now what? And there's a possibility that, that where we are sitting now, today, uh, we'll need to relocate. Yeah. Uh, but that means your book is a double call, well, perhaps even a triple call to action, eh? to uh, put uh, climate top of the list uh, in all places at the world, but also f help forge these global coalitions eh, where concerns of others become our concerns too. And of course, then a different change so much needed. Uh, and you've witnessed around the world these different stories. Are you going back 
uh, will you chase the, uh, the places you visited and uh, uh, capture them uh, with your images? Yeah, I've, I mean, it, the, the project had different phases, so I have been back to, to regions and countries where I've been before, but I was really thinking that maybe I should train a very young photojournalist who's maybe like 18, yeah. 19 years old yeah. to, to return in 40, 50 years, because that's when you will yeah. really see the change and the impact. I think that's a, a great idea. Let's find a way to make that happen. Uh, thanks very much, Kadir, for sharing that story. And now I'm, of course, very curious. The book. Eh? I brought you the first copy. Wow. <laughs> it's amazing. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, after us, the deluge. Look at this. It's, it's amazing. And uh, it's on sale uh, in the bookshop. Thanks, uh, Kadir, for sharing <coughs> the story behind the book. Uh, and the story of climate change you came across. Now, over to Cynthia van Elk. Uh, Cynthia, you also travel the world, not only chasing climate change, uh, but you found yourselves in, yourself in uh, Indonesia, uh, yes. for one, also India and Bangladesh, within the program Water as Leverage. But we're going to talk a little bit about Demak and Samarang, right? Yes. Um, tell us a little bit about the situation uh, in Samarang and Damak. Uh, people are living at the brink of climate suffering, uh, you could say. A lot is happening. It's not only sea level rise, storms and surges and even droughts, but it's uh, 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 subsidence, land subsidence, that is increasing their vulnerability rapidly. Yes. Share us a bit of your reflections. Um, it's severe land subsidence. Yeah. Um, about 10 to 15 centimeters per year. Wow. And that in conjunction with sea level rise of about, I think it's, I could easily say it's up to six millimeters per year. You have a, in that part of the northern coast of Java, you have what, it's a double whammy really. So you, your land is sinking and you have sea level rise. So it's a very dire situation. The coast there has retreated um, five kilometers, just about, since the mid-90s. Land has subsided because of um, industries extracting groundwater, uh, the weight of buildings, the soil in, the, in that part, also young alluvium soil. So it's, yeah. it's serious it's over serious. there. And the approaches they take, uh, and you said, well, you can say there are band-aid approaches, but you don't agree, right? Well, um, the people of Semarang and Java are just trying to adapt right. and make the best and make do. They elevate the roads, um, they will elevate the mosques, um, lift houses, put them on stilts. Inside, they'll put down um, bricks, uh, paving bricks, soil, wheelbarrows of soil being dumped inside, anything uh, to elevate the floors. Um, there are cement mixes on every corner of the street, construction. It's just an ongoing race against the water, yeah. land subsidence and flooding. Um, it's, the race is tight. Is it a battle? Uh, is it ignorance or is it true resiliency and adaptation capacity? Is it cultural? Um, I don't know if it's, if it's cultural or maybe it's just human instinct mm. that um, you, this is just what you have and you have to live with for six, five to six months of the year. There's water inside your house. Um, you have to cope with it. Yeah. Um, Imagine that you um, have to cook and eat and sleep and pray, watch TV, um, take a nap with water reaching up to your calves. You have family over and you, have, you, you celebrate holy days with your family and everybody inside the house is, is up to their knees in water. And it's what they do. But this they don't leave. Um, actually, before you go to I, they don't leave, I would like to share one 
little anecdote that really... There's a mother who is holding her baby in her arm pretty much all the time because the baby cannot crawl on the floor because the floor, the ground is inundated with water. It's just stories like that that I find just heart-wrenching. But anyway, sorry. No, no. You're, you were saying so they, they can leave. That's also a matter of adaptation. Eh? They yes. change a different behavior, a way how you raise your children, how you uh, uh, develop yourself in these places. And then, of course, the question is, they stay. Eh? Uh, there is nowhere else to go, or is there... Well, I have to say there's there's many places on the, along the coast where you'll see houses, deserted houses. Yeah. Um, they can be skeletons of houses, others are more intact. Um, some even have some furniture left in them. Nobody's living in them. And they're all surrounded by water. So it gives you this feeling where you can see what once was. There used to be agricultural land uh, where vegetables were being grown. And now it's, it's all water. Um, villagers say that the floods are double in size every year. Um, but they don't leave because uh, their sinking houses have become worthless they cannot sell them and without money they can go elsewhere they can buy another house or buy a piece of land so they just make do yeah. um, and yeah. they also can't because of personal reasons yes like in the example of Nasikin, who i think was portrayed here with his wife in front of his house uh, his house was given to him by his father and in indonesian culture you can't no. give away a gift so he will stay there and live in his house until the end of his life. But for his daughter, he has told her already, uh, when it's time that you leave the house, you definitely need to leave this leave this area. So there's a generational aspect. Yes. You came a, across a lot of stories, very imp impactful stories. One of them was uh, a fridge on top of a table. So, well, th so yeah. many of those stories tell the same tale, but can you explain? Yes, so with the fridge on the table... I was there when it wasn't high tide season. But regardless, the fridge was on the table. And it occurred to me later when I... Because when, when I'm shown around the house, you don't really think all that much. You just absorb. And then at the end of the day, when I look at what I photographed, it hits you. Um, so looking at that refrigerator on the table, I'm thinking, even when there's no water inside the house, you still live... Yeah. With water. You um, always live with water. Yes. Yeah. Whether it's there or not. It's yeah. it's phantom water in a way. Yeah. Which you can see also in the kitchen that has the, f the floors covered with seashells. Uh, the girls' bedroom that is really high up on uh, bamboo scaffolding. With water there or no water there. Um, it's always there. Yes. You just have a daily constant reminder yeah. that you live with water. Yeah. And we have to be reminded of that too. Right? Yeah. Are you going back? Is this the place you will visit every year to witness the change? Yes. What I've seen in Demak and Semarang was really so, uh, for me, like life-changing that I would like to go back and document. But more importantly, I think it's, it's the local photographers there that should cover these changes. Um, they're right there on the ground, they speak the language, are familiar with the situation, so um, I would really want to make a call. Yeah. And give them the capacities to do so yes. and reach the world. Yes. I see a link between the young photographer, Kadir <laughs> wants to help, and uh, you reaching out uh, with the help of others yeah. uh, to the local photographer. It's a good idea. So Maybe there is a good opportunity. We'll follow up. Thanks very much. Um, Let's go over to India. Super team. Um, welcome. Born in Bairapur. Yeah, thank good you, to see sir. you. Uh, you thank left you, sir. your job to focus on creating photo stories on socioeconomic yes, crisis, uh, human yeah. rights and environmental issues prevailing in the Indian subcontinent and bring them in front of the global audience. Uh, you travel to Bangladesh, Nepal and other parts of India for your projects. But we want to start with your work in Jaria, in the coal fields, in the Indian state of Jharkhand, which are among the largest in India. 
At first, congratulations on your second place in the UNICEF Photographer of the Year competition, Super Team. Thank you. Thank How you, do you sir. feel about that kind of recognition for your work? Yes, sir. Actually, I've been working over human rights and environmental issues from 2013, and it's really hard to get global audience and your hard work, your passion, your dedication will be meaningless until and unless your work is exposed by some of the most influential organizations or publications in this planet. So I'm quite happy about it and it really motivates me to work on and on over some environmental stories and bring them out in front of the global audience and make them understand actually who we are and where we are actually living. And I think it will create an impact to the bureaucrats, to the leaders, to the environmental activists so that uh, they will understand what is actually happening and I think they will take some steps to restore our environment. Yeah. It's a call to action too. Eh? When you, when you, yeah, when you travel to Jaria, to the coal fields, uh, and, and, and sh uh, took all these images that are now uh, 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 a series co you call the Curse of Coal. Was there a beforehand Absolutely. wanting an idea on telling a particular story uh, or did it come to you when you were there? No, sir. Actually, in 2013, when I visited there, actually, another time, I was literally shocked that after seeing that uh, hum there, there is some humanitarian issues as well as environmental issues. And, and after that, till today, I visited almost 50 times over there. And uh, I am really shocked when I see that uh, children almost five to six years old, they are working in the burning mines and in particular, in monsoon, the environment is totally full of toxic gases. So it's really horrifying to see that. Then on that time, I realized that I have to make a documentary over, uh, which is connected to environmental issues and also are humanitarian issues. And uh, where actually they will go, they are uh, too poor. And it's a horrifying scenario. And it's the environment of the coal field area is totally unbreathable. The air is full of toxic gases. So somehow we have to come out and we have to restore it. Yeah, climate change is a matter of human rights, eh? of equality, and of course yes, of sir. health. It's more yes, than sir. only absolutely, water. Sir. Yeah. Yes, yeah. sir, absolutely, sir. Because in particular in coal mine region, this is lots of toxic gases. Carbon emission is being increased, and which is why the environmental temperature of the environment is being increased, and that is why we are observing the rising in the sea. Thanks. So. Let's go over to the sea level rise. You went to the Sundarbans many times, yeah. eh? an area yeah. of mangroves yeah. in the huge delta formed by the three yeah. mighty rivers, the Ganges, the Brahmaputra and the Meghna. What do you think about people living there in these very difficult conditions, showing no signs of leaving? One of your, your pho photographs shows people carrying even bricks to build new houses. Can you tell a bit of what you came across? Actually, sir, Sundarban is only 35 to 40 kilometers from my hometown. Oh, so wow. it's right from my home. And the image you are talking about that it, uh, has been taken from the Bali Island in Sundarbans. And actually, the there was a construction was going and it's a government building. In, you know, in Sundarbans, there are almost 102 islands in Indian parts and 52 islands are dominant, human dominated. And some islands are big, some islands are small, particularly in the in, in case of the small islands, particularly in the coastal region, and everything has been washed away by the sea waves. And yeah, those who have money, they are moving to the different suburban areas or different parts of India. And those who don't have any kind of money and they are moving towards the higher land. Here, yeah, some government construction is also has been going, but one day, if we are not concerned about it, one day it will be damaged. Like other schools also has been damaged in Ghoramara Island. And I have captured this image. And yes, that's the scenario. Yeah. Do you, so going to these places at risk, uh, people being so challenged, um, is, there, is there any hope uh, when you, when you, when you, watch their lives, when you see what they're doing, do you have optimism? Sure, absolutely, sir. I'm very much optimistic. 
for my for my photography that it took spread the message to the world and the world leaders world bureaucrats they will come and they will they will actually understand actually what is happening in sundarbans because somehow we have to save our sundarbans if we could not do it then now at the end, our kolkata will be submerged definitely in one day and somehow that we have to we have to think about the environment of the sundarbans so there's many opportunities also uh, to curb climate change and become more resilient and adaptive and uh, the people in the sundarbans uh, that you witness with your camera are actually showing that uh, resiliency uh, every day yeah definitely sir they are fighting with high tides in each and every day particularly in the monsoon their house their house is to are totally surrounded by the sea waters on that time during the high tide they move towards the high land and after when when it comes to the low, low tide they come their home and they cook food and sometimes and uh, when the tide is too much during monsoon and they couldn't they almost unable to cook food and which is why on that time they even i i talked with them and they told me that sometimes five to six days they they didn't cook food they buy some uh, biscuits or something and they survive by eating biscuits and like this and it's a horrifying scenario and i took this image uh, uh, drinking water it's seriously affected there they want tea well the women were collecting drinking water from a tea well and the tea well is totally surrounded by sea water and i asked them that and i tested the personally tested the water and the water is too much salty it's totally undrinkable but i asked them and they said that where we collect drinking water there is no way we have to drink it yeah that's the scenario yeah. it's really horrifying yeah but uh, your optimism comes from the opportunity to also show this to the world and help raise the voice of the people at risk global call to action you say this is uh, 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 maintaining the dignity of the human race even how important is that for you actually sir definitely we are the most intelligent species in our planet and that doesn't really mean that we will be keep destroying our planet we have to save our planet for our future generations yeah. if we continue this then our beautiful planet our diverse planet and will be damaged one day and our entire human race will be wiped out from the face of the earth like prehistoric animals and definitely we have to take care we have to take care about the carbon emissions and like other things so you, and you say we, we can to, so we have to yeah yeah yes sir, we yeah. have to yeah okay thank you so much uh, super team also for joining uh, uh, Cynthia and Kadir in this uh, call to action uh, a call to action to the world to step up um this was the end of our uh, cultural mirror uh, to the world uh, showing on the urgency uh, the necessity of taking action action the suffering in the context of climate change but also the powerful resiliency uh, the capacity of people to live with water and climate change on a daily basis uh, you showed us that there is no other way forward uh, than to step up uh, and inspired uh, and of course stimulate us to take the necessary climate action. I want to thank you all, Super Team from India, Kadir and uh, Cynthia here from the studio. Wish you good luck, good health, um, and also want to see how we can bring this call for young photographers and local photographers um, into something that we can really uh, make happen. Thanks so much. <laughs>